mentorship is a really about one thing, removing barriers for success. I'm able to put in front of these Gen Z students, you know, 13 or 14 individuals who are, you know, powerful senior people in sports who they all say, please come network with me. I will help you. Mm. And to me, that's the most valuable thing that I can do for, for you is get the hell out of the way. Welcome to Warriors at Work. This is Jeannie Coomber, your guide and host. Warriors at Work is a place where everyone in the workplace can come together, gain insight, encouragement, tell stories, connect and share wisdom. We are a place of like-minded people at different stages of life, all coming together with a shared interest of enlightening and inspiring one another. If you're interested in going from the predictable to the potent, and you want to find your warrior magic, step into the journey with us. Welcome to Warriors at Work. Hi, everybody. It's Jeannie. Thank you so much for joining me here at the Warriors at Work podcast. So today, I got to have a really fun and fascinating conversation about leadership and legacy through the lens and power of mentoring. I was joined by John Schwartz, who's a senior leader of communications and public affairs. He has over 25 years of experience working in organizations like the NFL, NASCAR, MasterCard, Bank of America. He is also an adjunct professor at NYU in the Preston Robert Tisch Institute for Global Sports. He is an advocate, he is a community leader, and more than anything, he really embodies what it means to be a servant leader. He's been able to package up all of his interest and passion for mentoring, and he created something so powerful a podcast called The Sports Mentoring Project. This is where John invites well-known figures in sports, people like Joe Torrey, and asks them questions like, who's your greatest mentor? What's your superpower? Who are your mentees? What are the qualities of success in a mentor and a mentee? And in this conversation, we get to break that down through the lens of John's professional life. How has it impacted him? How have mentors played a role for him? And you're going to hear a couple of things about John. Right off the bat, he's an incredible storyteller. And you will feel the passion and conviction he has around the power of mentoring to change the experience we have in the workplace. We can create more happiness, more success by adopting more of a mentoring mindset. You are going to be so intrigued by listening to his stories and all of his experiences. And I'm sure at the end of the conversation, you too will look at mentoring through a different lens. Enjoy. Welcome to the Warriors at Work podcast. This is Jeannie Coomber, your guide and host on this journey. I am so excited to bring to you this conversation with John Schwartz. So John, thanks. For, thank you so much for being here with me today. So appreciate you share in your energy and all the things that we're going to talk about, about you and leadership and legacy. I'm thrilled to be with you. Thanks for having me, Jeannie. So I was reflecting on all the things that you are in the world and all the things that you do. And you're a senior leader of communications and PR. You've got over 25 years. So clearly you're a powerhouse in that space. You're an adjunct professor. You're an advocate. You're a community leader. But how do you describe yourself? Pro I'd say this, this is going to sound trite, but a and cliche. Go for it anyway. Certainly, servant leader, and a coach, and a mentor, and someone who has great empathy, and who wants to make a positive contribution to the workplace in in a way that may be a little different than than other people. Yeah, we're going to get into the little different, and I I. So John and I recently met, uh, connected through a mutual colleague, and it, it was instantaneous. Like, so he has this very contagious energy about him where everything's possible. And you have so much passion. You have this beautiful combination of really powerful competence and expertise, but you're so relatable and so engaging. 
And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation about John's story and this really important work that he's putting out into the world, which is really my next thing here around this amazing endeavor, the Sports Mentoring Project. You invite well-known sports figures, people like Joe Torrey, as well as some incredible uh, athletes, and ask them questions like, who's your greatest mentor? What's your superpower? Who are your mentees? What are the qualities of success in a mentor and a mentee? Tell us the story of why you started this in the first place and what's the response been? So we've all had people in life who have helped us, some more than others. I've been the benefactor of a lot of help um, uh, along the way. And in the form of sort of people giving me time, people who are more mm. experienced or mature or had um, a different skill set or a different um, uh, viewpoint based on the experiences they collected over time. And they gave me this wonderful time. And I was standing in line to waiting with my mask on six feet away from the person in front of me at Best Buy. I was going to pick up, I think, some earbuds. And I started to, my mind started to wander. I haven't called him back. She reached out to me on social media to do a touch base. They, um, they decided that you know we were to, to talk in the next two weeks, and and I've just I haven't done my part to reach back out to to my mentors and just say thanks. I don't think I've ever properly said thank you. So this, it, simply put, is my endeavor to thank my mentors and to shine a light on things they did to help me along the way. Wow. Talk about paying it forward. I think it's paying it back. Honestly. I mean, truly like, you know, I'll never forget. I was, I was very, very early in my career and ESPN, the magazine was in, in their six month planning phase of about to launch being about to launch. And here we are full circle and ESPN, the magazine magazines in general are, yeah. are, gone the way of the dinosaur but i'll never forget the 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 editor who was pulling it together um sort of a family friend um gave me an hour of his time and he he gave me his full attention in person face to face and clearly he had some he had been someone who probably has as much experience as i do now but back then he was someone who was really a a, a really respected person in the industry and he gave me an hour mm. that, that was it and he, you know, I, I talked and, and he shared some perspective and advice. Um, and I left by him saying, I don't have a job for you, but I wanted to spend some time with you to help you. And, and that was uh, the last time I had spoken with him. And about 20 years later, I was asked to moderate a panel and he was on the panel. Oh my God. And I literally recount, recounted the same story. And, he, and I don't think he really even remembered it, but we, we shouldn't ever underestimate the power of giving someone who is asking for help or counsel or guidance or advice time, even if it's an hour or 45 minutes, because you may run into a situation where 20 years later, you're sitting on a panel with somebody acknowledging that those 45 minutes that that person gave you 25 years earlier. Wow. What a cool story. You tell it as if it happened a week ago. Like it, it, it here's what's so interesting about you too is is not only is this this endeavor something that you've put out into the world as a way to thank and acknowledge your mentor's contribution, but this is so tied to your whole leadership experience, how you lead, how you create cultures where this type of dynamic is, is so palpable. It's one of the things that I just love about how you're doing this work. So I'm also thinking about this in terms of like blowing this out a little bigger. When you think about the workplace and you think about mentoring full stop, you just did a recent interview uh, with Laura Ronsky from Survey Monkey, who hosted a workplace happiness survey that directly relates to what you're putting out into the world is really, really important ideas around mentoring. Can you share some of your thoughts and reactions from that interview, and but also what the feedback pointed to? 
So I opened season one of the Sports Mentoring Project with an introduction. It was called Why. And my intention was to have this bonus episode in each season that sort of speaks to why mentoring is so important. So I spoke with Laura, and she's at SurveyMonkey. And each year, she partners with her client, CNBC, to do a series of survey, surveys about happiness in the workplace. And last year, the focus of last year's survey was on mentoring, which I, I was like, mm. I need to talk to Laura. And here's what I found. She says this, we have good news. Those with mentors at work report they have more autonomy and they're less likely to leave. 79% of those with mentors are actually more likely to say they're, they're well paid. Whether it's mm -hmm. true or not, they're more likely to say, I, I'm paid well. 89% of those with mentors believe their contributions are valued by their colleagues. And the big one was half of all U.S. workers have a mentor at work. So the bad news, half do not. Mm. And she does not, which to me was like... How did you find that out? Did you actually point blank ask her? I asked her. Yeah. And she said, no, I don't. And she she basically said this. Is the, the, the upshot of this survey and the work is this. Mentorship at work makes employees happier. Full stop. And mentorship is much more important to younger people and people, uh, younger people and minorities. So millennials, Gen Zs, women, people of color are all more likely to report that they have a mentor at work. But we also know inherently they're also more likely to be underrepresented in positions of power, mm. right? And Laura said, mentorship delivers benefits that companies would normally have to pay for. So, I, yeah, I was like, well, okay, money clearly isn't the issue, right? If it doesn't cost employers anything, why are they not more focused on creating activities, organized or otherwise, um, to encourage mentoring? Now, I believe it's a double-edged sword with, with mentoring. If you organize that in an activity around mentoring, does it take away how special those organic selections and interactions that take place? Um, so, you know, and another question is he says, you know, you know, people have more one who have more one on one time with their boss are more likely to say they're happy. Yet, why are supervisors struggling so mightily to give to make that time for their 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 employee? And it made me realize you know, maybe the the challenge is time itself, mm -hmm. you know, especially in a, a virtual workplace that does that doesn't allow for the separation of work and life that you know sort of we all once have. And or maybe this the satisfaction of being a mentor is simply underreported or undervalued. You know, if you think if you're at a t at the top or near the top of an organization. It's only natural you're unlikely to find a mentor at work because you are the most experienced person at work. And this forces senior leaders to look outside for mentorship and look outside for their definition of mentorship. So, you know, each day, here we are, more and more of us are slowly being physically reunited in the workplace. And, you know, and, it, and it, it's safer, which is great, but it, it's also different, right? And we know that FaceTime feeds mentoring. So, as you know, what we may want to do is consider planning for not just a safer way to come back to work, but a better, safer way to have those hallway conversations, to have those break room reconnects <laughs> mm. and, and, and encourage more of the casual Popeyes because, you know, we, do, we need to find more ways to let more people join the party. And, you know, this does not need to be an organized activity. And that was really my finding from my time with Laura. So there, there's a couple of things that I just want to pull out there for a second. First of all, do you feel that organic mentoring, well, well I should say it this way. What's your opinion? Is it organic or is it assigned? The, 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 I love this question because um, my my best and most honest answer is I have no freaking idea. <laughs> um, when I was at NASCAR, we had a culture that 
uh, was surrounded by sort of making every, the team feel like they were part of the planning and execution. And it, it was, it was fed. I mean, we had this burning fire that needed to be fed about, you know, helping others inside the group. Mm -hmm. So we decided let's this year focus on mentoring. So I started a men mentoring program at NASCAR, which it looked so good on paper because I was able to sort of pair senior people with junior people, people of different um, genders, races, ethnicities, religions with other people. And I really found these really cool pairings that I felt like, you know what, not only is this going to introduce people to having a real conversation with one another when one normally wouldn't have if we said you're his mentor and mentee, but also it may open up a dialogue that that sets somebody um, up for success, sets a mentee up for success, a millennial at the time up for success. And I would say about 15% of those assigned mentor-mentee relationships worked extremely well. And some of them, a handful of them, including ones I have, uh, are, have endured until today. 80, that, so that means 85% of them failed. Mm. So I, so I, so was that a success? Doesn't sound like it, but there were a few that came out of it that have endured that are a direct result of us saying, let's do an organized mentoring project. But, I, but I did discover overwhelmingly that the organic mentorship, the office pop buys, the someone I trust in my network, outside of my network, someone I met at work or my boss organically, that allows for a little bit more honesty it, uh, and, and, and allows people to be a little bit more comfortable and direct. So I think there's a place for both kinds. Um, but the lesson I learned from NASCAR is I think organic mentorship has a, has a better impact on the longevity of that relationship. Yeah. I, that what's so interesting about that too, I would imagine that, and I found this in my own experience is I think it's important too, is mentoring isn't necessarily just seeking people who have more experience in terms of workplace experience. I get a lot out of mentoring people that who are younger in their career. They teach me a ton about how I'm seeing the world through a lens that maybe is outdated or things that I need to shift. I love getting into conversation. I learn so much by people who have different levels of experience than me. Um, so I'm just kind of highlighting that because I know you've had a lot of experience, particularly working with NYU students that have opened your eyes. I'd love for you to share some perspective there too. So first, uh, the first part of what you're saying, I think is spot on. I would say right now, about a third of my mentors are younger than me. Does that wow. surprise you? A third. Wow. Yeah, it does. That's a big number. And so for me, I realized that, you know, age and experience and wisdom that I believe I've collected is not enough. How am I supposed mm -hmm. to learn from um, someone who is a millennial or a Gen Z, if I, if I organize in my mind that my mentor needs to be older than me. So the NYU is a great example. Um, you know, over the last 10, 10 or 12 years, it seems as if every meeting I've ever been in with a group of people around a, a big table or virtually has been, has asked the following questions. Yeah, but how do we reach millennials? Yeah, oh, but we need to do something for Gen Z. And I guarantee you 100% of those people around the table, or uh, maybe 90%, I should say, may speak to millennials and Gen Z, but it's only because they're related to them. They're mm. their children. None of, very few of them, I'd say probably nine of 10 of them actually have an audience with millennials and or Gen Zs every week. And that's really... I had an opportunity to go teach at NYU in in the Tisch School, uh, the Tisch Institute for Global Sport, and really what I'm looking at it is I get this free audience with Gen Zs, this now Gen Zs because back then it was millennials bordering on Gen Zs, free audience twice a week. That's what I get out of it, mm. and I get to ask questions and get and solicit responses that inform 
that ha- that allow me to have informed opinion to answer those two questions or the one, the one or two questions yeah. that keep getting asked around the boardroom and that get batted around with, with people who don't talk to Gen Z's outside of their home. So it's really a blessing for me because I am learning so much from them. The other, the other thing, it, it's pretty intriguing with the class is that I believe, especially with young people, certainly with my children, um, that the brain is like a sponge and there's an ability to soak up all this wonderful information, but at some point the sponge gets filled, mm. right? And and you need to squeeze the sponge out. So that's why you don't have one teacher that stays with you from, from first grade to eighth grade, right? And so similarly with, with, I'm a college professor, I think in a way, like I feel like I'm cheating my students. I talk, I share, I do lectures, I do assignments. We, we you know, there's texts I assign. Um, and I'm running the class, but I believe the best thing I could do is shut the hell up and put <laughs> people in front of them who could actually help them in their careers, mm. not just by appearing in the class and talking and, you know, sharing their knowledge and their experience and talk about some of the emerging trends, but I'm able to put in front of these Gen Z students, you know, 13 or 14 individuals who are of senior you know, powerful senior people in sports who they all say, please come network with me. I will help you. Mm. And to me, that's the most valuable thing that I can do for, for you is get the hell out of the way. Yeah. And, 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 and I believe the, 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 the mentorship is really about one thing, removing barriers for success. And so if you're a young person who's in a, at a university or a school, you are looking ahead to enter the workforce, a barrier for success could be, I don't have contacts. Yeah. So here are 13 or 14. Now, does that mean that I have, you know, 15 to 25 students all following up with each guest speaker? No. In fact, probably two to three students will take advantage of each respective guest speaker. But that's their choice. Right. I can't, I cannot um, force anyone into, and that's my view of, of teaching, is that I put, pe- put other perspectives in front of you. If you choose not to go chase those down, that's their choice mm-hmm. that I have to respect. Do I think it's a good choice? I don't. Right. But at least I've done my part in get, getting the hell out of the way. Yeah, it's like you're you're the conduit, but you can't bring them there. Like here, I've created the path. It's up to you now to step in there, which leads me to my next question. I'm curious when I when you think about your leadership style, how you're running teams, running organizations. Do you think you can teach mentoring that skill to people on a team? I don't know. All I could do is focus on me and the person that's sitting in front of me and giving them my undivided attention without looking over and checking email or checking my phone or looking down the hall to see if my boss is passing by. Mm. Right. And I believe that if I do that the right way, and if I start with listening and I offer, you know, I'm filling their bucket with whatever they need a shoulder to cry on, or that sounds cliche or advice or counsel or suggestions or whatever that I'm modeling good behavior and that if I model good behavior that I can control that, if I model good behavior, perhaps they will become a mentor or a good mentor or both to Mm. someone. But I can't, I don't know that you can teach it. I think you just need to act it and do it. And I think the good news is, is I think companies are coming around. Corporate America is coming around to this notion of, uh, we believe mentoring is important. We're seeing we're seeing what the what what SurveyMonkey and CNBC are doing. We we see the value in it, so we're gonna do things to to enable that to happen, which is great. Um, you know, one of the things that I talked about, um, I dropped the episode today of um, Emmanuel Acha, who wrote "Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man." He's got a smash hit YouTube series of the same name. He's a former NFL player. He's his mentor, perhaps is the most famous mentor in, in the world, Oprah Winfrey. 
And so I asked him, I said, specifically, because, you know, throughout my career in sports, um, you know, most of my mentees and mentors have been white males. Mm. Um, you know, I could choose to apologize for that or I could choose to be honest. That's the truth. Have I had uh, uh, other races, genders, ethnicities, religions who are my mentors? I have and I do. Full stop. But I asked him this. How can I be of service mm. for black men and women to people of color as a mentor or as somebody at work to be helpful? And he quickly retorted with the following words. You can't help what you don't know. Mm. And I said, huh? And then I said, huh? Wow. I, okay, I'm, I'm now picking up what you're saying. I, if I don't have the same set of experiences of a black woman who's trying to climb the corporate ladder, if I am giving advice to a young black man who is on the precipice of breaking to the sports industry or breaking out of that first or second job and elevating, how can I possibly give advice if I don't understand, if I don't know mm. some of the things that that person, uh, some of the unique challenges that that person has faced along the way and currently. Um, but that doesn't mean I can't, no. And that I don't know based on sort of asking questions and sort of seeing it through the lens of someone else. And um, when I was at NASCAR, um, we had a, an internship program and you can only, and still to this day, you can only get an internship if you are a minority. It's called the NASCAR hmm. Diversity Internship Program. And for a sport like NASCAR, which throughout history has struggled so mightily with diversity, equity, and inclusion for, you know, a sport that only last year removed and banned the Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. um, they have to work that much harder to make the sport a welcoming and inclusive, inclusive environment. But if you want to have a diverse workforce and you're, uh, you're a brand like that, you know, and this program was founded, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, how do you attract diverse talent? You do it by creating a, an internship that's only open to, to to people who are diverse. And it was very controversial. And I think in many ways, people are like, that's unfair. Or that's still, no, it's not unfair. It's necessary for NASCAR and other brands and corporations to do that so that opportunity can blossom. And the what for me it, the aha moment was is that I would never have been introduced in my circles in through NASCAR circles to the pipeline of talent that came through that program. Mm. There, you know, the there's a a, a, a young man. Uh, he's not that young anymore. Named Juson Hamilton. He spoke to my class uh, a couple of weeks ago, and his job is to sit in the biggest and most stressful seat during a NASCAR race, week in, week out. He's a race director, and his job is to make sure wow. that the rules are enforced, that he organizes the track cars on the track and the safety vehicles in a way that keeps the competitors, the teams, and the pit crews safe. Mm -hmm. um, he started out as an intern in, in, in my department. Wow. That's and amazing. In the PR department. And it's like... Wow, great. So now there's a model. And, and yeah. so I wouldn't have understood his story or his perspective. This kid grew up racing. And the only reason he ended up in the PR department was he was just trying to get a foot in the door. And now he's calling, he is calling races. Not right. because, and, and it's because he's the best at it. And he just happened to come through the PR department. Wow. What a cool story. So cool. You know, you talked a lot with me when we were preparing for this conversation and you're, you've already hit on some of it is about gratitude and how gratitude plays such a crucial role in mentoring. So, so share a little bit of your perspective there. Yeah, I, I think um, there is, I think I had a guest that I spoke to yesterday 
Uh, he is a one of the most legendary sports announcers of all time. And as we were preparing for our conversation, he and I were going back and forth over email. And I explained to him that early in my career, when I was just a young pup, I was an intern. I bumped into him at a game and he made some time for me. He gave me some advice. A couple of years later, he ended up calling me on the phone because he needed something and he had remembered our conversation. And I explained to him, you know, you were this mentor from afar for me, right? Now, that's different than, Jeannie, you are my mentor, be my mm. mentor, act like my, mm. give me mentorship. This, this individual is such a humble person that he was uncomfortable characterizing himself with mentors. Now, this is a man who, for the last 25 years, has accepted demo tapes from young people who are mm -hmm. trying to break into sports play-by-play -play broadcasting to the tune of 50 demos a year. Wow. That means he has critiqued, evaluated, and offered feedback on 1,250 demos. Now, if you're going to listen to a demo, you're probably going to spend at least an hour listening to, it, listening to it and critiquing it. And this is wow. someone with such great humility, he says, I don't believe I'm a mentor. So mm. that brings us back to gratitude. Mm. You know, the, the person that I spoke with, the editor at ESPN Magazine, I had no contact with him at whatsoever for 20 years. Yet I have other people in, in my life who I have contact with um, every week who have no other reason to be calling me or vice versa outside of this mentorship dynamic. And for those both those two kinds of situations, I'm extremely grateful. And I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one story that for me, it, in many ways, set 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 the tone for my career and, and gave me some great perspective. I went to the University of Maryland. We had a club hockey team. So I went, I loved the hockey. I, I went there to go play. And, but along the way, I decided I want to uh, focus on journalism. And as such, I decided to write for the school newspaper, The Diamondback. And then I wanted to write sports. And I, I sit on the Shirley po Povich Center for Sports Journalism now at the University of Maryland for the following reason. I handed in my first story to my sports, sports editor. It was about a football player. It may have been a kicker. Um, my editor picked up the story. He, he looked at it quickly. He looked back at me and he took $15 out of his pocket <laughs> and he put it on top of the story and he handed both back to me. And he said, thank you for the story. Um, but we're, we just, we just can't use it. I'm not sure you're going to be able to work here. And I, I, I was speechless and I, I took a few steps. I started to walk away. And I was at the door and I turned around and I said, I'm having trouble processing what you just said to me. Why? Like, what, mm. what was it? What you made this decision in, th in five seconds. Can you give me something? <laughs> his, his name is Chad Capelman and he is younger than me. I think he's a year younger than me. And he kind of sighed and rolled his eyes and said, come here. He's like, grab that chair over there and sit right next, like right behind me. And he proceeded to edit my story in front of me and mm. look at my thoughts, content, and words and reorganize them in a way that adhered to the guidelines of the inverted pyramid style, which is how you write a news story, and also sort of took my thoughts and, and improved my work. And why, why I was staying engaged, because it was my content. I wanted the feedback. And he reorganized me, rewrote my story, and he agreed to let me keep the $15 and publish the story. But it was a big aha moment for me mm. because I had no idea. I thought I was going to walk into the Diamondback and hand in my story and the next day see it, see it in lights and I'd have 15, I'd have some beer money. I didn't realize that someone younger than me was going to be so brass and so harsh but so incredibly helpful mm. and change the trajectory of my career inside of 30 minutes. So 25 years later, it was about last year or so, maybe it was more longer. I had no contact with him. Again, I reached out and I recanted the same story and he quietly, <laughs> he quietly sat on the phone and listened. And 
I think I don't know how he felt on the other end, but I do believe there's something there. There's a moment or two or more in your career where somebody helps you and it is mentorship, but it's not the traditional way in which we all think about mentorship. So gratitude, I am grateful to Chad Capelman. Wow. Another amazing story. Incredible. I, I'd love to talk about you. You're the, you think about just zoom out for a second. Think about some of the most powerful mentors you've had in your, your career or in your life. First, let's talk about what you would like for them to say about you. So if you could just have one in your mind right now, like one that stands out, what would you like for them to say about you? And then we're going to talk about a mentee. What would you like for them to say about you? So I'd like my mentor or mentors to say about me that I have an incredible work ethic, mm. that I'm strategic, and that I have and possess and exude empathy. Mm. And what about a mentee? A mentee, I would like my mentee or mentees to say that I give a shit. <laughs> And that I, I deeply care about them personally and their career trajectory. Mm -hmm. And that, that they're, I'm helping to remove barriers for their success. You know, one of the things that strikes me about you, and I, I talk a lot about this, not just in my coaching practice, but in my life, is, is the importance of being seen, heard, and understood. And so much of what we're talking about here with mentoring, whether you're being mentored or you're mentoring is providing that space to be seen, heard, and understood. And all the stories, everything that you've talked about is creating the space, having the time and the space and, and making that a priority uh, for that. I, I love the stories. So let's look down the road. What do you want to have happen for the sports mentoring project? Look, you know, do I want to get great guests? Do I want to grow my following? Um, you know, do I want more listens or do, you know, do I want to monetize it? Or, you know, do I, uh, oh, sure. Yes, of course. Um, inherently, I realize that all those things are selfish, but I have to acknowledge them. But really what I really want is that it becomes a catalyst for change. Hmm. Not just in the workplace, but, you know, across sports and the things that make us happy because mentorship happens on Little League fields, too. Yeah. And and so, you know, I, I look at, you know, um, these conversations that I'm having and the guests that I'm, I've been able to book. And I think I've been able to book them because, one, they know they said st we established up front that I'm not about to ask them about, you know, something that's topical or controversial. What I am going to do is give them a platform like I have to thank the people that helped them. And I think that's why I got to yes with these people and why I will get to yes moving forward. But ultimately, if if someone, one or more people on the other end don't listen to the podcasts and don't take something from it and 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 change their swerve or the way they approach life or or maybe even do something to affect change on their own, yeah, I will be disappointed because I do want it to be a catalyst for change. Mm, I love that. So let's let's talk about you personally for a moment. Um, obviously, what what I'm trying to do here at the Warriors at Work podcast and all of the live conversations is is I want all of us to really stand for our greatness. I'm looking to create a movement of doers and thinkers who are activating and elevating the greatest parts of ourselves. But that requires that there's people in our community that help us stay accountable and focus on the things that we've said are most meaningful. So who are those people? in your life that are help, helping you to stay accountable? My family and friends and the, the people that are in that, uh, who I have a mentoring relationship with, whether I'm the mentor or mentee and, you know, people I check in with on the regular. Okay, great. And, by and, and, and with that, do you have any, 
daily practices, things that allow for you to step back into what my best looks and sounds like? Do you have any daily practices, things that are grounding, things that you're doing that just get, keep your consciousness? Because you're incredibly aware of who you are in the world, but are there things that help keep you sharp like that? Generally speaking, laugh, be in the moment, and help somebody. Now, again, like I know this sounds extremely trite and generic, but I will say what, what goes along with that is I don't have a good day every day and I don't mm. do that every day. There are days where I fail to do all three things. There are days where I fail to do all three things. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm better at doing favors and helping than I am accepting favors and, and having, mm. having help. And so, you know, I try to build into my routine, you know, laughing, being in the moment and helping somebody with, with, with the hope that that, that could exist through a variety of actual tasks that I do every day. You know, you know, um, um, Judy Holler, who I think you probably know, um, she, she has a, she's a, she has a pretty big following and, and, and my wife turned me on to, to her. And, and one of the things that she suggests people do at the start of their day is set the vibe, mm -hmm. um, which is like, set your space up, whatever is meaningful to you, wherever you feel like will you be most productive with a clean desk, a cluttered desk, a candle burning, a, you know, a cup of coffee, whatever that thing is. Um, and so, you know, the, you know, you know, that's how that's how my wife sets uh, sets the vibe, and that's what the routines that she gets into every week. You know, mine are a little bit more um, generic and flexible. Mm, I love it, but clearly, you start your days with some sort of intention, which is usually the guidepost. What what's the experience I want to have? Um, and I'm so grateful, John, for you sharing so many amazing stories and so much wisdom. And I'm so grateful that you started the Sports Mentoring Project and the incredible wisdom that's coming from that. And I'm wishing you so much goodness and great, great success in the months ahead. Thank you, Jeannie. And I, I enjoy Warriors of Work. I enjoy your work. I enjoy the space that you're delving into. I think it's important. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing more of your content as well as we uh, as we inch closer to the spring and summer. Yes. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for listening to another episode of Warriors at Work and letting us be a part of your warrior journey. You can ask questions and make suggestions for future topics at jc at geniecoomber.com. Connect with me personally on LinkedIn and Instagram and join us on the Warrior Conversations channel on YouTube and at the Warrior Magic Community page on Facebook. You can find links to all these places on my website, JeannieCoomer.com. And most importantly, be sure to tell friends about us, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Spreaker, and Spotify. It helps others find the show and puts more warrior magic out into the world.